Mm. Why D&D's response to the OGL controversy is destroying the brand, we break it down on this new episode of The Character Sheet. This deal's getting worse all the time. Welcome to The Character Sheet, comicbook.com's home for fantasy and tabletop news. I am Christian Hoffer, and I am joined by producer Pete. And today, we are going to talk a little bit about Dungeons & Dragons responds about the recent OGL controversy that's been going on. Now, if you want to get caught up on everything that's happened, I highly encourage you to check out our coverage on it and check out the coverage on io9 by Lynn Codega. Uh, they've done a great job at covering this, have, have really broke the story wide open, and we highly encourage you to go and check that out. Yeah, and if you haven't seen their response somehow, we're going to have it scrolling up here for quite a while so you can read through the whole thing. But the long and short of it is they D&D basically doesn't apologize for this OGL 1.1 leak. They they pretend that it is a draft, that it was never meant to be a real thing. And we have a, a lot of evidence pointing towards that being an absolute lie. And then they have a lot of vague language about the license back stuff that's not really fully fleshed out, that doesn't really give these third party creators any kind of protections it's just more of a oh we'll deal with it in the future and we'll change it a little bit but we won't tell you how but let's let's start with the big thing and that they specifically in several points here say that oh this is a this was a draft this was just meant to get some creator feedback this wasn't a real thing but uh one of the biggest ways we can immediately disprove that is that kickstarter and the executives at kickstarter have admitted to negotiating a 20 percent royalties deal based off of the 25% royalties package found in the OGL 1.1 leak. And you would never do a good faith negotiations for a 20% royalty fee based on a rough draft document. Clearly 25% royalties was their plan, which is why Kickstarter had to negotiate a separate deal for 20%, mm -hmm. which immediately disproves the ridiculous idea that they are, you know, that this was just a draft. This was never meant to be a real thing. And then we've also even now heard from some more creators, right, Christian? Yes, uh, there the several creators have come out, um, you know, and well, let's let's be clear. Uh, many creators have not come out because they uh, supposedly signed NDAs um, in which they uh, were presented with this revised OGL and, um, you know, and it was presented as basically a final draft. Um, so the description given here about how this was a early draft and how it was meant to, um, you know, basically uh, be open for feedback um, kind of runs counter to what io9 and others have reported in that people were forced to sign ndas and were presented with this ogl along with the contract to sign now i will say the comicbook.com has not been presented with the contracts that were you know allegedly meant to be signed we have seen the ogl 1.1 draft uh we were given the copy of that but we weren't given the copy of you know any contracts that they were supposedly asked to sign and if you have one feel free to send it to us uh, for us to review, um, but you know, there are definitely some very competing narratives. And given the fact that the OGL was never meant to be deauthorized, and that was the stated intent, and even if it wasn't explicitly stated that it was an irrevocable license, you know, the people who made it and Wizards of the Coast for years said that older versions of the OGL would always be allowed to be usable. We might not make SRDs for the new versions of the OGL, but we can never get rid of old OGLs. And now that they've gone back and are basically trying to say we're getting rid of the new uh, of the older OGLs, it really throws it, it, it creates a level of mistrust in everything that they've had to say since. Um, yeah. Which brings us to the next thing that this statement does not say. They do not state that they are going to not deauthorize the OGL. Now, Paizo has said uh, in a statement when announcing their plans to create their own open gaming RPG license, or I believe it's called the ORC for short, the Open RPG Creative License, um, that they'll, that uh, when when they announced this, they said that they would stand up in a court of law if they had to, to state that they could that Wizards of the Coast could not deauthorize the older versions of the OGL. How the OGL was always meant to be used was that Wizards of the Coast could update it, 
they have every right to update it to a 2.0, a 1.1, whatever, with as unreasonable terms as they would like. However, creators would always have the right to use older versions along with the SRDs that are authorized for those versions to make content. So if Wizards wanted to make a more restrictive open gaming license 1.1 or 2.0 or whatever you call it, and only release the 1D&D SRD for that version, publishers could just continue to go and make fifth edition material uh, without consequence. And Wizards of the Coast has not committed to saying that that would be the case. In fact, the lack of saying anything about that makes it seem that they are going to attempt to deauthorize the older versions of the open gaming license. Yes, this is very true. And a lot of people now, like the big question here is, why does this matter? And the answer is, well, with Paizo coming out with something like the ORC, which is their version of a, a you know, lifetime free open gaming license, a, a system agnostic, anyone can use it. Um, why would any third party publisher trust D&D, Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro, after seeing them get caught out in multiple lies in the response to this OGL 1.1, not knowing if, you know, if let's say you invest, you know, very strongly in your in another project and then it turns out, oh yeah, they are going to revoke 1.0 and you've invested, you know, half of your company's income in a fifth edition, uh, you know, supplement of some sort. Well, then you've just lost, you've probably crippled your company for life versus why would you not go with Paizo who has not been caught in a series of lies, who has not burned all the goodwill they had in the community and who has committed to having an open uh, gaming license that you can use in perpetuity. And the answer is why wouldn't you like why I don't, I can't see a reason where after which has been caught in so many lies that you would ever trust them. And in a, in a system where, and in a environment where a lot of these third party publishers are living and existing off of narrow profit margins, why would they risk that at all with Wizards of the Coast if this new ORC comes to exist? Because the safety with the ORC just seems so much more secure. Like it's just, it's so much less of a risk in a time when a lot of companies are trying to really balance that risk reward uh, margin because they have, you know, very narrow profit margins that keep them going. One of the really striking things when I was covering this story over the past week was how many creators told me, third party publishers, third party small creators told me that they were on projects that were put on hold just by the specter of Wizards of the Coast planning to change their open gaming yeah. Uh, license. Yeah, this and, has already cost you, people jobs. Yeah, uh, almost every single small creator I know, every freelancer I know, was on a fifth edition project that was placed on pause or canceled outright because of it. And, you know, we saw a lot of companies make major shifts. Now, some, you know, have tried to minimize this. For instance, uh, MCDM, the company run by Matt Colville, you know, has said, they've said many, many times they were always planning to make their own RPG. All that the open gaming license stuff did was basically uh, turn it into a priority for this year. They were always probably going to start working on it this year. It might have just bumped it up the timeline. But a real consequence of it was that their uh, magazine Arcadia, which is basically the modern day equivalent to Dragon Magazine, yeah. uh, is canceled after July because they're not going to hire any new, you know, uh, not hire. Uh, they're not going to get any new articles. They're not going to solicit any freelancers for new projects involving that magazine moving forward. They'll still publish everything that they already have paid for, but they're not going to make anything new. And that's a really big loss to fifth edition. Sure, it's not official Dungeons and Dragons content, but the thing that the OGL did back when it was created was it kept people within the D&D ecosystem even when Wizards of the Coast wasn't producing new material. Wizards of the Coast only puts out four to five D&D projects a year. And some of those products aren't things that you know everyone cares about. The, the Keys from the Golden Vault is an anthology adventure. If you don't care about small anthology adventures, you're not going to buy that book. Okay, um, you know, uh, glory, glory for the giants is giant themed subclasses and giant themed spells and stuff like that. If you don't really use giants in your 
uh, campaign, you're not going to pick up that book. So what all this third party material did was it gave you other options so you could continue to run Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition campaigns instead of teaching your players how to play something like Pathfinder, Call of Cthulhu, or one of the many other great games that are out there. And, uh, you know, it, it kept them within the system. It kept them interested in Dungeons and Dragons specifically. Yes, and that is, this is, when we talk about how this response has potentially doomed D&D, that's exactly why. Is not only are third-party publishers not going to trust in anything the OGL has going forward when they have the option of the ORC from Paizo, so not only are they going to lose that just... And to tell to give you an example of how important that is, before the OGL, D&D had about a 50% market share in 2000. After the OGL... In 2022, it was 85. percent mm -hmm. So the, yeah, it, it almost doubled the size of their brand. That's just going to be evaporating over the next several years. And uh, one of the last things we didn't mention, and one maybe potentially weirdly one of the biggest things, is one of the reasons for that explosion has been these big brand ambassadors like Critical Role. Mm -hmm. And if you saw Critical Role's response, uh, this terrible response from Wizards of the Coast has put them in a horrible position where they're getting chewed out by their own fans but they're under an nda they can't really respond as strongly as they would probably want to and so they have to put out a statement like this one which is you know we support the creators but we're not going to call anyone out because we can't really do it we're negotiating with dnd we're they're basically stuck in the middle of a campaign of a dnd game that they can't get out of until the campaign ends and they have to finish these rights negotiations because their current campaign is tied up in it and so they're kind of stuck eating the, the shit sandwich that has been prepared for them by Wizards of the Coast, and there's nothing they can do about it. And this is true for a lot of big, you know, actual plays and podcasts out there. Like, they're stuck dealing with all this backlash, and oh, there's boy. just no way that this is... Like, why would you want to go back into negotiations with a company like this that will just hang you out to dry at a moment's notice? And the well, answer is they probably won't. More importantly, you know, yeah, like Critical Role, probably because they have some sort of partnership with the Wizards of the Coast. D&D Beyond is a sponsor mm -hmm. for Campaign 3, um, which is, of course, owned by Wizards of the Coast. There's probably a non-disparage uh, agreement of some kind in place. Oh, there has That's to just be, yeah. our speculation. That's not a fact. Um, but, you know, Critical Role, you know, uh, it speaks volumes what they didn't say. In this. Yes. But, you know, smaller actual plays, you know, like, for instance, we found out that Dropout does not have an agreement with Wizards of the Coast. This there's, is true. That's you know, why they've probably never no, done supplements. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to say that, you know, basically the, the current, uh, you know, Dimension 20 campaign could be their last D&D campaign. Brennan likes running D&D, but, you know, he he's probably apt for switching now. But, you know, with smaller actual plays, one of the reasons why they were incentivized to play 5th edition is because they could release 5th edition content, uh, you know, books and supplements via Patreon, uh, via, you know, mm. books or stuff like that. You, you've seen that with uh, Venture Maidens, uh, you know, different different actual plays. Yeah, uh, a, a big proponent of that exactly is Jacob from um, uh, Level to XB3 or Level 3 to XP. I always do that reverse, but uh, they also they do... Uh, a series of releases tied to their own campaigns. And yeah, that's the kind of stuff that you just can't, you're put in this horrible position of if you stick with this company, you don't know if you're going to have the right to make money off of your own campaign going forward. And, and that's, you know, that, that's a livelihood that, for these people. Yeah. And that's really disappointing. Um, you know, there's a really great article that I wrote, not to toot my own horn. Um, XP level uh, three, but, sorry. It's XP level three. I just remembered the right way to say it. Sorry, Christian. <laughs> No, no, you're fine. Uh, so there's an article that we published over on comicbook.com, which kind of examines the uh, increasing um, like dissociation uh, between Wizards of the Coast and the Dungeons and Dragons community that when 5th edition first came out, they heavily promoted. Uh, you know, we didn't have a D&D Live this year. Now, you know, obviously still pandemic, uh, still a lot of technical stuff, but, you know, we didn't have a D&D Live. Um, Wizards of the Coast is not currently sponsoring any ongoing actual plays. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they just wrapped up the, uh, you know, the uh, Even Star, I think it's called, uh, campaign. Uh, Black Dice Society is over. Um, you know, they don't currently have a campaign that they can point to and say, oh, this one's ours. You know, they're, they're not sponsoring any. They're doing one shots every once in a while, um, but no ongoing campaigns. Uh, you know, there was not a Dragonlance campaign. Like, usually when they release new uh, campaigns, 
they go and you know have some sort of actual play that goes along with it you know even to show give people like a taste of what's to come they didn't have any of that for dragon lands and that's really bizarre and really kind of speaks to the importance or the unimportance that wizards of the coast places on the dungeons and dragons community that they built up and you could go on and say there was never a Dungeons and Dragons community or the Dungeons and Dragons community has always existed separate from Wizards of the Coast. And that's always probably true. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that at one point, Wizards of the Coast heavily promoted the sense of community as a big part of Dungeons and Dragons. And now it's all about the brand. Yes, as my dog goes crazy in the background. Uh, yeah, it's... This, when we talk about D&D being doomed, like this is... This is sort of the nightmare scenario for them. Is how it, would you? How do you? How do you recover from that? Based on all of the polls that we put out to our community, that we've seen on Twitter, this the vast majority of fans, at least for right now, don't see a way back for D and D. And there are a few things that can maybe help it, like the fact, like the D and D movies coming out, and that's not real. Like that's that's paramount more than Wizards of the Coast, honestly. And that's you know, it's something that's sort of aimed at at fans it's not you know it's not as tied to wizards and hasbro as a lot of the stuff we're talking about and maybe that can help bring some goodwill back because it actually looks very good but i just don't see a path if everything keeps going the way it appears to be going i don't see a path back for dnd now that that doesn't mean they're going to vanish next year but i think we're going to see that market share every year going forward just you know four or five percent just keep dropping and dropping and dropping and they'll have no one but themselves to blame because to to wrap it up because this is we've we've gone for about 15 minutes here it's it's like it's it's really people there's stuff that they could make like they could they this is it's both arrogance and laziness there are things that people have been demanding from fifth ed they could make themselves and sell huge amounts of and they just don't do it because they've been relying on these third-party publishers to push their brand forward and they've just driven all those third-party publishers away instead of putting out, you know, their own new character classes or their own new additional base equipment, weapons, and armor. Just things that people have wanted in 5th Ed forever. They've relied on these third-party publishers to basically be the backbone of their company. And then they've just driven all of them somewhere else. And I don't yeah. know how you get back from that. Yeah, th- there is a definite shift in how Wizards of the Coast is approaching Dungeons and & Dragons and this OGL controversy really highlights it. Um, we will probably talk more about the rumors about 1D and D. And again, these are just rumors. We don't know if they're true or not. Um, you know, but it is, you know, there's always been, you know, Wizards of the Coast, because of the OGL, has always garnered a certain amount of goodwill amongst the community. Um, because they allowed their game to be used for commercial use by other people. You know, that kept Dungeons and Dragons at the forefront of the tabletop RPG. A lot of people complained about that. Um, but, you know, as long as that OGL was out there, people were going to produce content for D&D and made it the game of note. Now the OGL, um, you know, is no longer reliable. That trust between Wizards of the Coast and, uh, you know, publishers and designers is now gone. Um, and it's going to take years for it to re- be rebuilt, if it can be rebuilt. We, you know, they have just put one D&D in a position to be the new fourth edition. Yeah, and let's I'll, I'll just end it with this. And then I think maybe the biggest thing in all of this that could have helped them um, is the two things that you don't see in their response. And one is to really fully take accountability. They make a little joke about, oops, we rolled a one, but then they follow it up with a bunch of lies, which makes it, it completely takes all the sincerity out of it. But the second biggest thing is there is nowhere in this thing an apology. There's, there's nothing in there saying... You know, we're sorry for, we clearly overstepped and this was a mistake on our part. It's all about like, oh no, you didn't understand. This was just, this was something that wasn't like, you made it into something it wasn't supposed to be. They just like, the community was looking for an apology and a promise of something better going forward. And instead they got a lot of lies. And I don't know. We'll have more on this as it goes, obviously. This is an ongoing evolving story, but... You know, for now, well, let I'm, us know what you think. Yeah, because yeah, do you think D and D can come back from this? Yeah, and and one disclosure: when when Pete says lies, that's how the community feels. Is that's that, how. Yeah, that is you know, that is what as, it appears to be. It is still obviously like maybe it was a draft, but from everything we've seen, like there's there's lots mm-hmm. of ways to disprove that. But yeah, for legal reasons, let me clarify: 
Things yeah, that we yeah. uh, appear it... to be lies to us. <laughs> I'm Pete. That's Christian. Thank you guys for watching. Feel free to leave a like and a subscribe if you feel like it. And we will see you next time on The Character Sheet.